Frontline Entertainment, Fossil Records, and Don Glute. To the Batmobile. Let's go. Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. You're ready to move up. Adventures of Sand Film Podcast. Grove's emulsified nose drops bring to your radios the further interplanetary adventures of Sand Film Podcast. It is the same daring and resourceful Sand Film Podcast whose exploits have held you spellbound in the newspapers. Now through your loudspeaker of almost every Saturday, travel with Sandboy Will and Christopher Mosier to the lost continent of Atlantis on the ocean's floor, failing in an attempt to escape from the land of Titans when it is invaded by Don Glute of the Iron Kingdom. Sandboy Will and Christopher Mosier are sentenced to death in a pit of molten iron. The Empress Luana of the Titans so far has escaped capture, but Chris and Will are led to the pit of molten iron forced to mount a scaffold, and placed in chains preparatory to being executed. What will be their fate? What possible escape is open now to... Fanboy Will. Emperor of Atlantis, and his loyal friend, Commander... Christopher Mosier. In a moment, we will have the answers to these questions. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, children of all ages, of all Mr. Don, Mr. Don, Mr. Don. How are you? Can you hey, hear me okay? Don. Yes, sir. How are you? Fine. Good evening. This is uh, Fanboy Will from Fanboy Theater. How are you? I'm fine, but I, it sounds like the same voice to me. <laughs> there are two different people I'm talking to, right? It is, yeah. Okay, I'll do my best. Uh, Fanboy Will from FanboyTheater.com. I, uh, it's a fan film review website. Um, you know, I showcase and I review fan films and, uh, you know, amateur-made movies. And okay. I've been doing it for a while now. And uh, I started up this, this podcast with my friend Chris Mosier here. And uh, we interview uh, pe- people that make fan-made films based on existing properties, superheroes, science fiction, stuff like that. And we know you're, you know, one of the, you know, probably the pioneer. Well, you know, I used to think I was. And then now, you know, after, you know, now I'm finding out there were amateur movies made you know, back in the 1920s, there were clubs that did things, science fiction groups and, and photography clubs and things. So I was, um, you know, go back to the 1930s and 1940s. So I was hardly the first. But as far as what was going through my mind at the time, I didn't know anybody else in the world that was making amateur movies. So as far as, um, you know, it's like the guy, it's like the guy who grows up on a desert island and invents the wheel. He really did invent the wheel, even though. The wheel was invited, invented, you know, tens of thousands of years before that. But from his perspective, he invented the wheel, and that's true. So I was like the first as far as I knew. And then, it, you know, I'm just finding out in more recent years that uh, a lot of people were doing the same thing and actually a lot better than I was, including really? Hugh Hefner. Like Hugh, Hugh Hefner was doing films? Yeah, Hugh Hefner. I saw a documentary on Hugh Hefner, and uh, he was making, like, Frankenstein movies in his basement. Um <laughs> You know, when he was about the same age I was, but Hefner's older than I am, so, you know, he, he did this earlier than I did. Yeah, I, I know in the in the 60s, uh, Andy Warhol was doing films also. Mm. He did something like Batman against, um, like, the vampire or the Dracula. Well, oh, okay. Um, there was a, a documentary on Warhol on, I think it was PBS, uh, a couple years ago, and they actually showed... Um, it's hard to tell if they showed the whole movie or if it was just a clip from the movie because of some of Warhol's movies, you can't really tell, you know, <laughs> if you're seeing a whole film or not. But this was a shot, it looked like it was shot on somebody's roof. It was people in capes and fangs and things. It was in black and white. And um, I think the title was Batman Dracula. Um, right. And, and they ran clips from it. And luckily, I, I happened to have my VCR handy at the time when I was able to um, get, get, you know, tape some of that footage. Wow, that's long lost. Do you still have that? Yeah, somewhere, and I don't know, thousands of tapes. Yeah, I don't. I remember uh, reading about it, saying I'd love to see that. That'd be really interesting to check that out. And I, I'd never get a hold of it. Yeah, well, it was on some PBS documentary about him. Maybe I can and uh, some, uh, run that again. You, you know, you might want to check it out. Oh well, I didn't realize that. So how how far did we get there, uh, Will? I was uh, grabbing the other phone when you started. I was basically just telling uh, Mr. Glute about you know who we so are. You got first of all before we go any far, you got uh-huh. about the Mr. Glute stuff. Oh, okay, Don. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> My father was Mr. Glue. Right. You know, so. I just, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for you, so I feel like I have to call you. Yeah, exactly. 
It's like if we were talking to George Lucas, I'd have to say Mr. Lucas or Mr. Spielberg. <laughs> we're not worthy. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. We're stuck. So what would you like to know? I could get things started, I guess, with um, we're kind of like, I don't know if you'd say this too, Chris, but we tend to feature films on our podcast that are you know, of the superhero genre, uh, more so than, say, like, other types of, you know, like, sci-fi or stuff like that. Yeah, dinosaurs, that. vampires and things. You know, we know you dabbled in a, in a lot of different types of, of amateur films, including superheroes, monsters, uh, you know, dinosaur films, stuff like that. Right. Um, but I wanted to start at your first, I believe this is your first superhero Phantom would be Shazam, am I correct? Not Captain No, it was Marvel. Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel, which is the correct name of the character. I hate yeah. to call him Shazam. <laughs> that was probably one of the worst movies I ever made. I, it's a really, I, I really would have preferred not to have put it on that DVD collection. But uh, in all fairness, to make, uh, to present an accurate picture of what I was doing and how one thing kind of led to another, I decided to put it on unedited, no tinkering around, and let just let it speak for itself. But that was the first one I did, Captain Marvel. And then I followed that with um, Super Duper Man. Yeah. <laughs> and I followed that with the Human Torch. And after that, I think it was um, The Adventures of the Spirit. After that, it was uh, Spy Smasher vs. the Purple Monster, I believe. And then after that, I think I did Batman and Robin and Captain America. Battles of Red Skull back to back. Then I moved out to California and I did let's see Captain America versus the Mutant, followed by Superman versus the Gorilla Gang, followed by Animan versus Martian Invaders, and I think the and then Spider Man was last. I think those are all of the superhero films I did. Oh, Rock yeah, I remember Man seeing that Spider Man was your your last film. That was in uh, six was it sixty six, I believe? Sixty six or sixty seven. I would actually have to Yeah. Add up. How would you feel about, um, should, you know, Captain Marvel as a learning experience, being your first superhero made amateur? Well, it was a learning experience. It was a learning experience, one, one thing, and what not to do. Because by that time, when I made that movie, I was really getting paranoid, about, paranoid against editing for some reason. I, um, I was always afraid that my splices were going to break or they weren't going to stick and I would lose another frame. This is when we were editing with those old, you know, those old-fashioned um, splicers where you would lose a frame of film every time you made the splice. And if it didn't hold, you would have to do it over again. You would lose another frame. So I decided to shoot that one completely in the camera. And um, even matching cuts and everything, I, you know, I, I attempted to do that, and I, I pretty much did that. And uh, because of that, there's some really strange editing going on or non-editing going on. So it was at that point that I met Larry Ivey, and he explained to me really the importance of editing. And I saw some of his films, and they were so much better than what I was doing. And they really moved fast, where Captain Marvel kind of got bogged down in all these edits that I was trying not to do. And uh, also, I'd never done a flying hero before, and uh, I didn't... I'd, didn't have a clue as to how I was going to do that, and um, in a, so that was like a learning experience in many ways. It was a, a different kind of film I'd never made before. Before that, it was all as you said, dinosaurs and vampires and Frankenstein monsters and that sort of thing. That's still hard to to, to kind of pull off as the flying superhero, even to this day with amateur film. Well, you know, when I saw Larry Ivy's films, he showed me a Superman film. He showed me a couple of a Rocket Man film. I had no idea how he did it. It looked like a it looked like something out of a Republic serial and. It, and at that time, I didn't know how they did it. Really, um, it his flying scenes looked. You know, it wasn't like a cutout or a cartoon or anything. It was a three dimensional figure flying through the air, casting shadows on things. And I mean, it looked like a real a real creature. I mean, a real flying uh, character. And then I finally uh, found out that what he did is they were just simply models. You know, little miniatures, and that he made and um, strung up on uh, you know threads or. You know, fishing line or whatever. I found fishing line worked nice because you could shoot up against the sky, and it was pretty much in, invisible. Uh, you know, that kind of bluish, transparent fishing line. And um, so I kind of eventually started doing that myself. And luckily, GI Joe figures and Captain Ac Action figures were coming out at the time, and it was easy to take those. And by making a costume or something for it, you could make a, a pretty reasonable. Um, 
facsimile of Superman or Rocket Man or somebody else, and, and I used those, and I just strung them up. I, I used to get straws, the kind of drinking straws, like you're drinking a, a soda or something with, and I would cut the straw, a little bit of the straw out and glue it to the, to the, to the back of the miniature, and then I would straight use the, the straw as the, the guide for the, the fishing line going through it. I would thread the fishing line through that, and then I would have one person hold up uh, one end of the line and another person at the other end holding it, but lower, so the gravity, uh, the weight of the miniature would sail it along, and gravity did the rest, and then I shot the scenes, you know, with a kind of a, a low angle looking up, and I found if I had the characters, the flying characters moving really, really fast, and I shot them at 64 frames per second, uh, which is way over-cranking, it would come out kind of in slow motion, and the effect would be not only that the character was flying, but it, that it had some kind of weight to it, so it didn't look like... Uh, that was one of the problems I really had with that Transformers movie. Uh, those things were moving so fast, I mean, they just divide the, the fight every law of physics, and I just <laughs> they look like cartoons to me. So... Yeah. But shooting it in slow motion, it gave, it's just like when you shoot lizards and things, you know, to make them look like dinosaurs. You shoot them with low angle and you shoot them in slow motion. And then when they're moving, it looks like they weigh something, like they have a tremendous weight. And the same thing held true for the flying figures. Didn't you originally, you, I, I saw one of your films where you were um, commentating on it, where you actually put like a silhouette on a car uh, windshield, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then drove along. That was Captain that was Marvel. Clever. I uh, I um, simply drew a picture of Captain Marvel, and I cut it out, and I, you know, I licked the back of it, and moistened the back of it, and I stuck it on the car window, and then, um, you know, my mother, whoever it was, driving the car, and I just took the camera out, and I, I shot through the window, and um, I did a still photo with a brownie camera of that on my back porch. And that was a famous photo that got published in um, Screen Throws Illustrated. And, there, and to this day, people ask me how I did that flying effect. It was simply just shooting a paper cutout up against, you know, stuck on a glass with the real background behind it. And you pretty much, you went to the movies, you, you saw the films, and you, you went home, and you pretty much tried to emulate yeah, the, I the special effects. That's basically what you did. I didn't, you know, I didn't. I made, I don't know, several stop-motion dinosaur films before I ever heard of Ray Harryhausen or right. Willis O'Brien. I didn't know how they did that in movies. Um, I figured those were all robots, you know, that Hollywood had unlimited amounts of money and, and could afford anything they wanted to do, and that those were actually remote-controlled robots. I had no idea that they were um, models moved a frame at a time, and I knew I couldn't. I couldn't afford building a robot, or I wouldn't know where to go to buy one of a dinosaur. And so I, um, I, it, it seemed logical to me that if you could make a cartoon move by using a series of, of drawings and shoot them a frame at a time, you could do the same thing with a, a clay model. And each different movement of the model would be comparable to each different sequential drawing that you were shooting to make a cartoon. And I tried it, and lo and behold, it worked. And uh, it wasn't until, I think it was 1962, when I met Bob Burns, Ron Haydock, and Jim Harmon, and I had that screening up at CBS, and they were talking about Jack the Giant Killer, which had just come out um, on Hollywood Boulevard, and it, it, was, it looked to them like a Harryhausen movie, and they were talking about this Harryhausen guy. I said, well, who's that you keep mentioning? <laughs> and it turns out, and that's when I really found out who Ray Harryhausen right. was, and that was how they actually did it in the real Hollywood movies. I didn't really know for sure until that moment. I also wanted to, uh, now you brought up some of the gentlemen, uh, I was going to ask you uh, about the influence on your career of uh, by Mr. Bob Burns, Larry Ivey, and D. Ray Craig. I know that yes. they, they influenced your filmmaking. Can you tell us about they that? They were the three biggest influences. I mean, other than uh, other than uh, my mother, who had who owned the camera, <laughs> and so luckily we had a camera. But I'm not sure, what, do, what, what would you like to know about them? Uh, I'd just like to know, uh, what did they do exactly that you, you know, you idolized? Like, what, were they also filmmakers, or...? Yeah, all three of them were. Um, okay. Bob Burns, of course, everybody knows what Bob Burns did. You know, he, he made amateur films among doing a lot of other types of things when he was a, a kid and, a, you know, teenager and a young adult. He was very interested in my films when I was living in Chicago because he was a friend of Ron Haydock, and I was corresponding with Ron Haydock, who was writing the, uh, the Graveyard Examiner column for Famous Monsters magazine. And um, there were some stories run around the same time of Bob Burns and Famous Monsters. And one day Ron said, hey, Bob Burns is a good friend of mine, and he's really interested in your work. So when I went out 
later that year to California for a vacation, I met Bob, and we became good friends, and I came out the following year and stayed a month and a half out here, and Bob and Kathy treated me like family. They took me around everywhere, and that's when I made that spirit serial with Glenn Strange playing the Frankenstein monster and had all those superheroes and monsters in it, all of which pretty much came from Bob's collection. So Bob taught me a lot about, he was working, he was an editor then at CBS, he taught me a lot about editing and match cuts and and coverage and this sort of thing, which I never knew before. It was like a whole new, you know, it was like a, a light being turned on in my brain, discovering all kinds of things about filmmaking that I never knew before. So, um... Bob uh, acted in a lot of my early, uh, a lot of my films around that time, and uh, he was just like you know we were like family. Uh, Larry Ivy, uh, who I met at a science fiction convention in Chicago in 1962, um, really taught me a lot about superhero films and and fast cutting and um, superhero type special effects and that sort of thing. And I saw a lot of his films and I kind of emulated him. And Larry and I became very good friends. And of course he. He was involved in Castle of Frankenstein magazine and Monsters and Heroes magazine, and he wrote a lot of little stories and things about my films and ran photos and things. Ray Craig, though, um, Ray Craig was a guy who taught, who, who let me know there was such a thing as USC Film School. I met him on that same vacation, and uh, he took me down to USC, and um, that's when I decided whatever it took, I was going to move out of Chicago and move to California, and that's where I was going to live, and I was going to make movies. And Ray, when I was going to USC as a student, uh, he was like my, well, he was a neighbor pretty much. He just lived down the street from me. And uh, I was at his house almost every night, just kind of hanging out and, and you know, having fun, and but also running movies down in his basement. Um, I, had, I was in a rock and roll band at the time. We used to rehearse up at Ray's house, and he used to record us. But Ray also was very much involved in the student films I was making at the time. And then later on, when Ray moved back to Chicago in the middle of the late 1960s, uh, he was involved in that whole underground movement, uh, movie movement, uh, underground film movement that was going on at the time. You mentioned Andy Warhol. He was you know, one of the originators of that. And through Ray's connections in Chicago with the Center Cinema Co-op, which was the Chicago organization that released underground movies to various you know, venues, um, uh, colleges, theaters, a little television, etc. Um, we got some of my superhero films released through that. In fact, um, Spy Smasher vs. the Purple Monster played um, at the Aardvark Theater in Old Town in Chicago. Um, and then it played on television on a chapter by chapter. <laughs> they were at, you know, a weekly basis, just like a serial was meant to be. And it's making a comeback because in November, um, at the Portage Theater in Chicago, they're going to run two of my real movies, um, our new film, um, Blood Scarab, and our first film, Dinosaur Valley Girls, on a double bill. And a selected short, short subjects we're going to run in 16mm, Rocket Man Flies Again, and Spy Smasher vs. the Purple Monster. Oh, I'm going to cool. be there for a Q&A, so that's going to be kind of fun. That's coming up in a few months. Make it out there. That would be great to see. Yeah, where, where are you guys located? I'm in, uh, I'm in western New York. I'm kind of outside of Rochester, not too far. Okay. And Mr. Will. Long Island. Oh, you're not in the same room then together? No. Oh, okay. We're across the state. We're microphone pals. That sounds like a pin can telephone. Oh, what's that? That's pretty much, yeah. It was, that, was, that was very another faint one. It's, it's underground podcasting, Don. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> podcasting, that's what uh, Kevin McCarthy did when he threw those in Invasion of the Body Snatchers. When he threw the pods, he was thought, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. We're hip. Too much for you. <laughs> Miles, where do they come from? I don't know. They are seeds or seed pods. They must grow someplace on a plant, probably. And somebody or something wants this duplication to take place. But when they're finished, what happens to our body? I don't know. When the process is completed, probably the original is destroyed or disintegrated. Did you get any input as far as from um, Marvel Comics and DC Comics Did at that time? Did, you know, a thumbs up to the, the films you were no, making? No, not really. No, because, see, when I was uh, making those amateur films, I was not in the business yet. I was not in the comic book business. Um, so the only people I knew were on a fan level. I knew Roy Thomas, who I think was a, a pro already by that time. And uh, I went to New York and they had a meeting with Stan Lee. I was actually trying to, I had the Spider-Man costume. I was actually trying to get the rights to make a Spider-Man. Spider-Man TV pilot. But God only knows how would I would have actually have done that. I was just a, I was just a, uh, a student at the time. But uh, Stan was very nice and gracious to me. And he explained to me why he could not give me the rights to Spider-Man. <laughs> uh, 
So I went and made an amateur movie, uh, Spider-Man, instead. But I don't think I had any real... Um, I, I don't think I even went to the comic book companies to ask for... I know I didn't ask for permission. Right. Yeah, well, yeah, there was really no... Co there was no reason for them to either cooperate or not cooperate. It just it was just, you know, uh, a part of my life of people who worked in that industry who I didn't even know yet at that time. Yeah, things haven't changed in 40 years, then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as far as... Uh, the fan film, making the fan films go into the companies and saying, you know, this is what we're going to do. They no. Go into yeah, it. I saw some of these things, and they look, I mean, some of them look unbelievably professional. Yeah. And then you get the crude ones, but you got to give them, you know, uh, you know, credit, too, because they're, you know, they're, they're putting their heart and blood, sweat, and tears into it. Yeah, yeah. Well, now, you know, now it's, it's, it's also they have the cooperation of, of collaborating with each other. I mean, when I was doing it, I didn't know anybody else making amateur movies. I mean, uh, but now uh, you can also, you know, you can... There's how-to books and magazine articles and things yeah. that were never available when I was uh, doing the things. And the studios are very secretive about how they did their special effects and things. And about the only thing available to me was a little publication called Kodak uh, Movie News or something that used to come in the mail about once a month or once every couple months. And it, you know, it told the you know, you know it was mostly promoting a new color film or something. But there would be little notices about people doing films you know, on an amateur basis, but there were usually things like travel logs and birthday parties and right. and that kind of thing. Uh, I wanted to ask you, I noticed you wear a lot of hats when you were making your, uh, obviously, your, your amateur films back then, being, you know, you did a lot of your own, you know, special effects, pretty much all of them, I believe, um, your costume work, your masks and all that, and your makeup effects and all that, um, and you also did your own stunt work, I understand. Have you ever gotten hurt doing any of your films? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, lots of times. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you, when you're... When you're young like that, you don't think anything of it. You know, it's just like a little kid who scratches his knee falling off his bicycle. You, you know, it hurts for a little bit, but just get you get back on the bicycle, and and that's what it was like when um, when we did Spy Smasher versus the Purple Monster. I tore the ligaments and two heels by jumping out of a window for a fight scene, and I was wearing these. Um, they were boots that that were originally belonged to a Nazi World War II Nazi soldier officer. And they had steel cleats that completely covered the heels, and they were about, you know, quarter, maybe close to half an inch thick, these steel cleats. And um, I jumped out of the window, and it was about, I don't know, a 15-foot drop, and I landed. For some reason, I angled my feet, so I landed directly on both heels, and all my weight got concentrated against the steel. And I tore my ligaments. I came in on crutches to school that, and this was on a weekend, so that Monday I came out on crutches, and um, everybody knew, you know, the, the, the Friday before I did this, um, I was sitting around our fraternity table, and I'd drawn this picture of Spy Smasher jumping out of a window and this crook firing a gun, you know, at Spy Smasher. And everybody said, oh, you're going to kill yourself if you do this. I said, ah, oh, no, 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 I've done this kind of stuff before. And then the next day, a taxi cab pulled up in front of the college, and I got out on crutches, and everybody there knew exactly what happened. So that was kind of embarrassing. Um... I uh, I took a lot of chances back then. I I jumped we, I jumped over a gangway from one house to, a, to to the next in that Spice Major film, and I jumped off a garage roof once uh, when we did the Human Torch. And uh, I had kind of a fear of heights, so that took me a long time to work up the courage to jump off that garage roof. Um, and I jumped out of cars. Really, we shot we had a car chase in that Spice Major film, and um, I had a guy in the back seat with the camera. Somebody sitting next to me, like a shotgun seat, and I was driving the car. And I, there's supposedly the, the, uh, the purple monster rolls a grenade on the on the road, and I have to get out of the car before the, my car blows up. So we did this all in one take. I literally jumped out of the car. At which point, the guy in the back followed me through the back windows, rolling into the underbrush with the camera, while the guy who was sitting shotgun slid out of camera range, slid over to the driver's side and took control of the wheel and kept on driving. So I did a lot of weird, you know, crazy stuff back then. But you don't you know, you get know about um, hurting yourself. You know, um, John Milius many years later gave me a quote, which I use a lot now when my actors are complaining in our real movies, which is, the pain is only temporary, the movie lasts forever. Right. And that's true. You know, the scene, I figured, well, and, and I used to use that old expression about Lon Chaney suffering for his art and having fish hooks in his mouth. And all this. I said, well, if he could do that sort of thing, I can jump out of a car. Yeah. So I did a lot of that kind of thing. And But, you know, you never, you know, you get scraped up a little bit and and so what, you know, you just... You get your scene, and move on to the next thing. So, do you find them so pampered today? Do I find what? You find them pampered? 
your actors and actors? actors. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I I was being unreasonable with my, but I was having. <laughs> yeah, you're a kid. You know, I never expected anybody else that I could remember to do anything dangerous. It was right. always me doing those things. <laughs> and uh, a lot of times, the actors were were very bold back then. I mean, when they weren't actors; they were kids, and they. Um, you know, they, they didn't think of anything either. I mean, they would jump off of things and out of things and into things and on top of things. And um, it didn't, uh, you know, we didn't use doubles or anything really, uh, but nobody thought about it back then. I wanted to ask you, uh, how did you pull up the effects used in your Human Torch film? Well, that this is one of my lesser masterpieces. Uh, I did it all kinds of ways. Uh, I tried, I actually, I, I at one point I... Um, not so, I got a clothes hanger, and I twisted it into the basic form of a person. So you had like two legs, uh, like a stick figure kind of thing, or a pipe cleaner figure, but made out of um, uh, metal. It was made out of clothes hanger. And then I got a black background, and I put this clothes hanger figure in front of the black background, and then I doused the clothes hanger in gasoline, and then I, I lit the, the figure, and it took on the form of a flaming, you know, head and um, body and legs and arms. And then I backwound the film, and then I got a shot. I think I probably did this the opposite. I got a shot of me then, which probably is what I did second, not first. I stood there in front of a door, and I said, you know, I held my arms out, and I said, flame on. And then I backwound it, backwound the film, and I did a double exposure with this flaming thing in front of the black and um, hope that they would sort of match up. And so you see me there, and I say flame on, and then suddenly in sort of the general area where my legs and arms and head and body are, torso are, you saw this flaming figure. A couple other times I did things like um, cutouts again on the window. I drew I actually drew a picture of the human torch, and I stuck it on the window of an L train I was riding in on the way home from school, and I brought my camera with me, and I shot just like I did with Captain Marvel. Another time I took a, um, a Ken doll, of Barbie and Ken fame, and I painted it red, and I strung it up on wires, uh, or threads, I guess, and I covered it with glue, and then I lit the glue, and that flew along until the threads caught on fire, and that was the end of that. And then I did close-ups. I had, like, a rubber hand I bought at the novelty shop, and I, I had it sticking out of my shirt, so it looked like my hand, and then I had, uh, I set that on fire. I did a lot of stuff with fire back then. I must have been a <laughs> pyro or maniac or something. <laughs> exactly. And um, then one time I, I, I had a scene where the human torch was in a, was locked in a, it's actually a garage, but it was supposed to be like a chamber of death, a death chamber, a gas chamber. And the villain turned on the gas, which was actually the exhaust of my mother's car, carbon monoxide. We didn't even think of that back then. <laughs> but I took my shirt, and it was a, it was in the winter, so I took the shirt I was wearing, and I soaked it in water, and then I put the shirt on, and my body heat made the shirt smoke, steam. And it was just one of those things. We tried it, and it worked. So, you know, all these different, it was, it was a, there was no one single way of doing it. There are all these different ways, and we, you know, combined to make the Human Torch character. It's all practical stuff, too, because nowadays... Um, even, oh, everything was practical. Yeah, fan filmmakers, they just, you know, go to their computer, and they can have any effect that they want. You had to do no, it all practically in the old-fashioned ways. Yeah. You know, we did the way the Lidecker brothers did it at, uh, at Republic Pictures, except I didn't use a full-size dummy. I tried a full-size dummy. When we made that Superman film, I actually went to a prop house, and I rented a full-size dummy, not realizing what I was renting was a stunt dummy, the kind of thing that you throw off cliffs and everything. So there was no, it wasn't rigid. The, the Lidecker's did it with a, a, like a wooden balsa wood, I think it was, figure, that was rigid and didn't move. Well, this thing was flopping all over the place, and we put the Superman costume on it, and I put little wheels on the shoulders and the heels that I, we attached to the dummy, and I tried, the, the plan was to go out to Malibu, and we were going to shoot, we were going to sail this thing from one mountain top to the other. We actually tried this, and the, 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 the fishing line kept stretching and stretching and stretching under the weight of the Superman figure, and finally, the Superman figure finally stopped sagging and it was like about two inches off the ground and i looked over at ray craig i said this is not going to work and so we went out and we got a, a gi joe figure and um revamped it and that's what we used the flying scenes for the flying scenes of a gi joe you gotta give yourself credit for it uh i know the light echoes actually used that technique you mentioned where especially in the, the old uh, Captain Marvel serial, where, where he flies at the beginning of the opening sequence, where he kind of comes in when the music plays. Right. He does that fly straight across. That's, that, was def, that, was, that was the wooden uh, dummy you see? Yeah, and uh, they did Rocket Man the same way. Oh. You know, 
Commando Cody and all those. Commando Cody, yeah. I'm a big fan of the old cereal, so I'll agree with you on yeah, that. Yeah, but those things were light. And, of course, they had, you know, whole, whole crews of people working on that. And they didn't have a dummy that was, you know, folding in on itself at every every turn. I was actually going to bring up, it's kind of funny that I know you, you know, your first uh, film, you know, superhero-wise, was the, the uh, Captain Marvel film. Um, I know that later on you ended up actually doing an episode of the uh, 70s uh, TV show. Oh, yeah, I wrote a Shazam episode. Yeah, and I know they kind of used some pretty funny crude effects, too. Uh, you, you know, I think, you know, the two lead actors was actually, like, would they get on top of cars or dollies of some sort, and they were getting... That was kind of like the middle stage, I guess, of the uh, the flying effects, the old uh, the old green screen. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of your your films have you know kind of like the the pretty pretty lifelike uh, sound effects and science fiction type noises and ray guns and stuff like that. Did you get those sound effects from from other films, or did you kind of make them up on the spot? Most of them I just got off records. Oh, you got them off side, like the uh, sound the effects records. records. Oh, that's cool. That's very cool. And what about the, uh, the the music? Same thing, musical scores from other... Well, the music, you know, although most of those films are made um, silent. Right. And when I used to show them here at my house, I would put records on or something. I had, mm-hmm. them, I had them transferred over to videotape at one point, and I just took music off uh, old movies and things. I had some, you know, soundtracks and things. And um, with the exception of Batman and Robin and Captain America Battles of Red Skull, Rock and Man Flies Again, Spy Smasher vs. the Purple Monster, and Spider-Man, those all had optical soundtracks. And um, for, uh, Rocket, for, for Batman and Robin... Captain America Battles of Red Skull and Spider-Man, I, I just used records. I used, uh, for instance, Batman and Robin had the Horror of Dracula. I used the, the theme from Horror of Dracula. Captain America Battles of Red Skull, I um, I forgot. That may also have been Horror of Dracula. I'm not sure. And then uh, Spider-Man, I, um, uh, I was over at Mike Nesmith. And- Anywhere 
then for the Teenage Monster movies, I recorded that myself. I just got together with a... Because I used to play Dwayne Eddy records and Link Ray records when I used to run those, things like that. And I got together with somebody I used to play in a rock and roll band with, and uh, he has a recording studio now. We just got together and we recorded 12 original cuts that became the soundtrack for the Teenage Monster movies, and we put those out on the CD, which if anybody wants to buy, let me know. I, I, I know a garage full of them. And, and, but then I decided, because the soundtracks on um, Spy Smasher and Rocket Man were so professional by comparison, and there were these old Republic cues that made, if some of them were actually from public domain Republic movies, like Raider Men from the Moon, I decided to just leave those. I decided not to redub those soundtracks, just to leave them as is. So that's why those two movies have soundtracks that sound a lot different than all the others. I was going to say, because, like, you know, in, in filmmaking, especially fan filmmaking, the soundtrack is very, very important. If you have the wrong music, it, you know, it could screw up the mood completely. Mm -hmm. and, uh, watching some of your older films, I noticed, you know, this, especially like the Spice Smasher one, that the music is very much on point. Everything's queued up with the action perfectly. So, well, is that I was, you know, I was... Panel, yeah, the, Dan Golden, who was my producer on Blood Scarab, and Dan and I have been friends for about 15 years. He's probably one of the most multi-talented guys I know in, the, in this world. And Dan was the guy who authored the DVD for, I was a teenage movie maker. And um, I gave him all of Alex's music. I said, look, put these in any way you want. You know, I'm not really that concerned. You know, But he actually did some matching cuts and things, and he did a phenomenal job, even though he wasn't getting paid any, any more to do the extra work. But he's kind of an artist, you know, and he, since his name was going on it, he wanted it to be as best as he could. So he, he took extra care in, in dubbing in that music. How long do you have, Don? Okay, because I'd, I'd really like to get into, um, you wrote a lot of uh, 70s, 80s cartoons, and okay. we'd certainly like to get further into your um, your current films. Well, current stuff, it's funny because you know I never thought of myself as a real actor, but now I'm a professional actor. I'm uh, dubbing in voices for Japanese cartoons being released here as feature-length movies in the United States. Oh, I've done three already, and I've done uh, three Guy King shows, uh, three Guy King movies. Oh, no kidding. I've done like six, seven voices per movie, and we're getting ready to do um, Captain Harlock might be next. Uh, wow. Vanguard Ace or something like that. I yeah. can't remember the name of it. Uh, we're doing both of those shows, and then we're going to probably do some Toho stuff, which would really be exciting for me if I could dub in the Godzilla film. I mean, you know, I never thought of myself. I don't like acting. I'm just doing it for the money. And um, It sounds like a lot of fun, though. It is. It, well, it's... Yeah. You know, I, I'm real antsy because I'm a director, and... You want to be I, behind the camera. I can't sit around... I look at these poor actors on my sets, and they sit around for hours and hours, sometimes days, without doing anything. And I said, oh, my God, how can they do that? It would drive me crazy. Right. I get... I get antsy just wait, waiting for them to set up the lights for the next setup, for the next shot. And um, so anyway, I mean, I, I'm digressing, going off on a tangent. No, that's cool. No, you did uh, actually a lot of 80s cartoons uh, written. You wrote them, actually. Um, yes, I wrote. I can't tell you how many. I have no idea. But, but I wrote a lot. <laughs> I did a lot of TV. fan of a lot of them. I could tell you a lot of them. I mean, but um, if, for example, I could just run off some names here. Uh, G.I. Joe, Transformers, Super Powers, Collected Guardian, Spider-Man, His Many Friends, Credible Hulk, New Super Friends, the list goes very, very far on. Um, how did you get uh, the gig writing cartoons? Well, I got, we have Jim Shooter of Marvel Comics to thank yep. for that. Because uh, we, we all got, you know, when Roy Thomas moved out to California, uh, Roy was getting a lot of us work out here, a lot of us writers, a lot of artists um, work. That's when you suddenly saw all these Marvel comics, uh, What If, The Invaders, and all those things being done by people here on the West Coast, like Rick Holberg, myself, et cetera, et cetera. Then when Jim Shooter came in, he pretty much wanted to get rid of all of us. And uh, I, I was at the Comic-Con in San Diego once. I happened to be walking by. John Byrne was talking to somebody, and he was talking about how um, Shooter was in a clean house on the West Coast. Well, he did, and we none of us really got work anymore. So we were forced to 
find another source of income to support ourselves. And luckily, uh, the animation studios were all out here. There was a lot of work being done. And um, some of the old timers were dying off or retiring, you know. And it was just a natural thing. We all got into the animation thing, which turned out to be better because we were doing a lot less work and getting paid a lot more for uh, working at Hanna-Barbera and Marvel Productions and Filmation and all these companies than we ever were doing at Marvel Comics. And uh, so that's how it happened. It, it was just kind of a desperate way of trying to stay alive. Uh, you speak about Roy Thomas. Is that the same Is that the same gentleman from uh, Alter Ego magazine? Yes, yes. And he was the editor-in-chief at Marvel Comics for a number of years. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, when Roy decided not to be editor-in-chief anymore, right. that's when Jim Shooter came in. And that's when every, all of us got, you know, phased out, pushed out. How how do you feel as far as writing comics and getting into animation? It it kind of sound not that, you know, you're you're against it or anything, but it it kind of sounds like you just did it because it was a job and it was work. And it, yeah, because it, you know, I, I felt I did things. I did much better work in comic books than I ever did in animation. I mean, animation is let's face it, TV animation is is pretty crappy stuff. It's all <laughs> it's it's, it's uh, yeah. It, it aims at the lowest common denominator. I used to find out that, you know, when I first started writing animation, uh, I would always try to make them a little bit better. I would try to put a little bit more personality or have a subplot that had a little bit of human interest to it. The story editor would always react the same way. He was, oh, Don, this is the best script we've ever read. You really, this is really unusual. Then I learned that by hearing those words, I knew I wasn't going to write any more episodes because they st- stood out. They weren't the same as all the other episodes, you know, and they wanted this mediocre kind of stuff. And so uh, I never put any pride, really, in most of the animation. There's a couple I, I you know, I was kind of uh, a little bit proud of, but uh, I did a thing called the, bee, the the duck and the iron mask for DuckTales, and I, I thought that was pretty good. Something's wrong with Dewey! Oh, no! Which one is Dewey? What's wrong with you? I'm sick of people getting us mixed up all the time. Uh, was that the original Sunbow Robocop series? It, well, it was the first one they did. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, that was the one it. I know. It was it was, we, they did it over Marvel. Yeah. And, um, you know, I thought, you know, I, uh, it, it, the story editors were, were kind of good, and, you know, they, they let us get into some more human interest types of things. But I thought the stories I did for comic books were, were generally a lot better than the cranked out stuff I did for, um, uh, you know, TV animation. And some of those things I did so fast. I, I remember uh, those. Transformers, that first season of Transformers, I was writing those things, first draft on a, type, on a typewriter, not a computer, first draft, and they, the story editors almost didn't read them. They just went directly to the uh, storyboard artist. And I was write, writing a script per day, a 55 to 60 page script per day on a typewriter. And, uh, and we were getting paid very well to do it. You know, these were basically half hour commercials for the toy company. All right. And uh, I, know you did, like, I, I look at those now. I don't know what's that, going on. I don't know who the characters are. I don't know right. what what's you know, just, no no characters. Apparently, really. they, they meant something to somebody because they keep getting fan letters and things about the they Transformers. The I'm a huge Transformers fan, so. Well, I think I, no, I was going to ask most Transformers were you the Dinobots in particular. <laughs> uh, were you were you in charge of basically creating their kind of their identities? Now Grimlock is very kind of simple. He speaks like a cave. Uh. I can't remember. We we were given uh, a Bible that had some kind of vague notions of what the characters were like. You know, maybe one sentence, this character is kind of a, a street thug type or something, you know. And then, But the, the types of dialogue and the things they said, um, yeah, yeah, we, we pretty much had free reign uh, on those. Because the story editors on Transformers didn't know what the show was about. They really didn't. They never, you know, they were basically Japanese giant robot shows. And they didn't know how to deal with the show. All they knew was that there were good, bad, there was bad robots that were trying to steal energy from the earth, and the good robots were trying to stop them, prevent them from doing that. And um, luckily, I had a background as a fan in, um, you know, the Japanese giant robot shows, and I'd written, I actually wrote an Ultraman script that I was paid by Super Eye Productions for a movie that never got made, unfortunately. And so I, I knew about how to handle big things in collision with each other. And, you know, the, the Dinobot shows I, I wrote where they're fighting each other, I simply, you know, I, I just try to recreate um, some of those Toho films of Godzilla, like Destroy All Monsters. Right. And there was a scene I remember in 
one of those where Mothra is pulling Godzilla by the tail, and he's kind of trying to retain his footing by digging into the ground with his front legs, but he's still being dragged along creating these trenches. And I wrote that into the script. And uh, it didn't come out looking the way I'd envisioned it because the animation was so terrible, but it, it that's what the basis was. It was destroy all monsters and Godzilla versus the thing and these things where they had these big epic uh, battles. But if you look at the Transformer shows, there's a lot of episodes in those first couple seasons. And the stories, depending on the writers, are so different from each other. Um, Doug Booth, for instance, did that one about... Um, uh, an Autobot or something in King Arthur's Court, which is it's totally different than anything I ever wrote. It's because we all had our own style and our own vision that we brought to these things, and they let us pretty much. They needed the, they needed those shows so fast, and um, they had to get them on the air so fast that pretty much anything we wrote uh, got accepted. Later, at the Hall of Justice. That's it for this week, uh, kids. That concludes our first part of our two-part interview with Mr. Dong Glut. Join us next week for the conclusion.